Of course, we've asked all we're going to ask of Sylvia. We won't ask any more, at least not tonight. <laughs> so let me get on with Fred. And don't forget, don't just leave the sitting seats through. We have a few more things after that. But Fred, please. and uh, today uh, to meet a lot of old friends and some new ones that made it here tonight that I had met over the last couple of days. And uh, pretty nostalgic to think back and think how long ago. And a lot of this stuff has been, I guess, Apollo 17 uh, this December is coming up on 30 years. Uh, for those that were here, and I don't know how many were here this afternoon, I told a little different uh, story. And the chronology is kind of backwards there. I went to Beyond Apollo and an experience in an aircraft accident and the uh, recovery to regain flight status and fly the approach and landing test. So I got to back you up a little bit. It may be interesting to back you up a long ways to, uh, to even growing up. Uh, a lot of people ask, uh, young people particularly, who weren't back in that era, and that, that's the age I grew up. Uh, did I want to become an astronaut? And the answer is very uh, easy to answer because when I was growing up, there were no astronauts <laughs> except for Flash Garden and Buck Rogers and Saturday cereals. <clears throat> we used to see at the Buck Theater in Biloxi, uh, which incidentally the ticket was a dime, and uh, you got to see a cowboy movie generally, Hop On, Cassidy, Do Not Tree, uh, Roy Rogers. And, and the comedy, and then you got the serial, and the, the serial continued for I don't know how many episodes, but you know, it was the old, old story of the serial flash garden every time would be hanging by his nails off the cliff, and sure enough, the next time he'd uh, survive and be back out of it again. But at any rate, uh, I really never got interested, even in flying, much less being an astronaut, for quite a bit of my uh, growing up years. Uh, in uh, high school, I'll call it my first spark of uh, energy and something other than just schoolwork or playing was uh, for the school newspaper. And I was sports editor in high school. And so I decided, you know, I was going to be a journalist. And uh, I worked, uh, had worked as a newsboy for the Biloxi Gulfport Daily Herald for a number of years, worked up the office boy. And uh, so I went to, to a junior college uh, for two years with the journalism as a major and was sports editor there the first year and editor of the Bulldog Barks for Perkinson Junior College in Mississippi uh, the, the second year. So I'm really set to be uh, a journalist and uh, work for the New York Times or Chicago Tribune, uh, Atlanta Journal, one of those uh, hotshot uh, newspapers. And then something happened, it's kind of like a lot of us in our lives, is something that changes our stream and our path. And that happened to be the Korean War. And uh, I felt I should uh, go serve. And behind that, my father, uh, who was a merchant marine 12 years and then a chief uh, machinist mate in the Navy, uh, always uh, incentivized me, well, two things. One is to get a college degree. And secondly, if I ever went in the military, to try to get in a program that would lead to a commission, that'd be an officer. And at the time, I, at that time, I had been through uh, two years of college, uh, was age 18, uh, and uh, with that credentials, two years of college and 18, the only program I could fit into and get a commission was a Naval Aviation Cadet Program. At that point in time, the Air Force required to be 19 with two years of college. So I really didn't have much choice, and actually my dad would not sign for me, because he wanted me to be in submarine. That was the, the, the service that was his thought of. The premier, premier Navy was going to be the Detroit the nuclear subs came along, and that was pretty premier in the Navy. So uh, I, my mother signed for me to go to the military because I was underage. At that time, you had to be 21 uh, to sign anything as an adult. So uh, I had, incidentally, I'd never been in an airplane in my life, any kind of airliner or nothing. I've been around an airplane. 
And uh, so it's kind of one of those things, uh, a lot of us, when we're that age, uh, you know, we sort of jump into things not really realizing sometimes quite what we're getting into. And uh, so I found myself at pre-flight in Pensacola and all these other people with me were talking about their white plane experience and ailerons and elevators and rudders. And I didn't know what none of that was. <laughs> but it was one of those things where uh, I sort of instantly uh, loved it. Uh, first time I flew, and of course, like I said, that changed everything. So then, as I went through that uh, tour and uh, ended up Marine Corps, even though I wanted Navy, and that was another turn, I showed up at Corpus Christi for advanced training, and when you showed up, you went to an office, a check-in, and they assigned you to the training unit you were to go, and it was kind of like luck of the draw where you showed up. And he asked me if I was a Navy cadet or a Marine cadet, because you could commit earlier in the program, which you wanted to be. And I said, a Navy cadet. He said, okay, look, listen. He said, you're going to PBMs, seaplanes. So I said, where's the Marine office? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I went down the hall to Major Umpiop and signed up to be a Marine cadet, which only meant I had changed my belt buckle. <laughs> because you can only get the attack or fighter if you went to the Marine Corps. So anyway, that's how I became a Marine, incidentally. Not a little minor ship, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I became a Marine fighter pilot. And there I talked to people and I read books uh, about testing airplanes. Some of the people had written books in those days, the ex early x series and before, and decided, well, you know, I love flying. And when I get out, I ought to make a career of flying. And test piloting sounded like a pretty good idea. So that then uh, meant I had to get an engineering degree or something comparable. So that put me back when I got out into school at the University of Oklahoma to achieve a degree in NR plane engineering. Uh, from there, it's kind of pretty, pretty steady uh, and logical because when I finished at uh, University of Oklahoma in 59, I went to work as a test pilot for NASA at Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, it's now Glenn Research Center, after John Glenn. And put in three and a half years there, actually following directly in the trail of Neil Armstrong. Neil started at Lewis and then transferred to Edwards, and that's what I did after three and a half years. A slot opened, and I went to NASA facility at Edwards, uh, where Neil had gone and uh, served again three and a half years there and subsequently applied for the astronaut program to be selected as one of the original 19 uh, out the, way back in 1966. And I'd have to say, it, it, when, when Mercury uh, evolved, I was still at uh, Lewis. In fact, we had the Mercury astronauts come through and we had a device called the Mastiff, which was a three-axis gimbal that you rode in the middle of it and spin it up and you'd have to recover as it capsule went out of control. And they came through from training for this rig uh, we built for Lewis. Uh, but I really, you know, Mercury, frankly, I have to admit, I thought during that time there was a one-shot thing. I thought we'd fly Mercury and that would be uh, the end of it. So I really didn't have even then the goal of being an astronaut. And the thing that really made me apply was the Apollo program. Uh, in the sense of the mission. Uh, the thought of going to the moon was just, uh, I mean, it was my body. So it was for that reason that I decided I ought to become an astronaut and fly and was accepted. And if I can get this machine to work, uh, Charlie, if I get you to uh, help here, I think we got to use this button. I'll set the stage a little bit later for so what comes next. Maybe say... Yeah. Oh, turn it up there. Okay. Up, 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 up. Turn it off. No. Wait a minute, Charlie. You still can't do anything right, Charlie. All right. <laughs> I can't trust the system engineer. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel we have a problem. <laughs> 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 All right, well, let me add Lib here while 
Charlie and uh, other experts try to get this machinery working again. <laughs> and uh, the movie uh, short I was going to use again is set the state. That's uh, one of the things that's obviously evolved after the Apollo program three years ago, in fact, now. Uh, that this movie was uh, done by uh, Ron Howard. <laughs> Sit down, Charlie. We need a <laughs> Where's Jack? Jack's the expert on the set. <laughs>
heart rate just skyrocketing. We're looking at less than 15 minutes of life support now. Ships bring the death. We're not going to have any power left to get home. No Eastern American in space failure is not an option. How does he leave me? We've got some serious kind of pressure here. <laughs> How long does it take to power up the line? Three hours by the checklist. We don't have that much time. It was an emotional thing to do, 
and the sense that uh, this is a pretty special event in your life, and you were allowed, for instance, to invite guests, family, friends, uh, to the launch, and Ken had done so, and these people had irrevocable airline tickets, and had uh, signed up for hotels, motels, and Cocoa, Cocoa Beach, wherever. That in those days, they, if y'all remember, they required you, I think, sign up for three days, minimum, and prepaid, guaranteed. So now, sort of 50 odd people are coming to this launch now to see the wrong person launch. And uh, conversely, Jack uh, didn't have time to do a similar thing for who people he might have wanted to come. Another very special thing we had was a PPK. We were allowed to carry a little bag. I don't recall exactly, it was like seven or nine ounces of stuff we could carry on the spacecraft. And, you know, if that is not much stuff, and uh, the bag wasn't that big, so you had to do a lot of searching about what you would bring for whom. Uh, I had a favorite aunt. Uh, I took her crucifix off the rosary. I couldn't afford to carry the rosary, so I had to remove the crucifix. Uh, I had a fellow test pilot, Edwards, I flew his mason ring. So, you know, we did those kind of things and prepped, and they were packed. Well, two days before launch, the wrong PPK was packed uh, for Ken. I guess he took it off. And Jack didn't have time, obviously, to do that kind of thought and call people or arrange and get things he might have wanted to bring. And this turned out once in a, once in a lifetime. Uh, the other thing the movie did with Jack uh, was the argument that ensued over throwing the cryo switches and the Jack look at the gauges. And uh, that was really ridiculous because that's a very routine thing. You don't look at the gauges to start the cryos. And if I had not been still involved with cleanup and the limb from our TV show that we'd say just put the stuff away, I would have been in the right, right, right couch position and I would have thrown the switches. So, you know, it wasn't anything Jack did that any one of us ultimately that electric chart happening would have occurred no matter who did it. The third thing was almost like make Jack stupid was the scene in this movie where he comes down, floats down behind us, and he's got a book, a checklist of some sort, and uh, he's talking to, he's done calculations about the maneuvers or burns that we've done and we're too fast, we're going to be too steep and we're going to burn up. Well, you have no way of navigating except with the software in the command module. That's the only place you had any uh, cislunar and translunar navigation. So in the limb, we were helpless that way. There's no way to ascertain any semblance of a correct maneuver. And behind that, we had uh, flown Apollo 8, uh, Apollo 10, Apollo 11, and Apollo 12, four missions to the moon before we flew and all the big course corrections, the ones that were used and burned, were mission control derived solutions from ground track. So there's absolutely no reason for us to worry that mission control gave us bad data. I mean, it's ridiculous. So that was the other point. I guess the, the whole characterization of, uh, of Jack, I felt, was undue in that sense. The only other thing was, uh, again, their use, uh, in some cases, of I call it off-color uh, vulgarity, uh, which incidentally is quite a bit of been cut. Uh, they gave it as PG-13 rating. I was frankly uh, surprised when we uh, spliced down and got back to help uh, to help write our portion of a mission report, uh, one chapter called the pilot report. We were given all the air-to-ground transmissions up and down, and there was never a curse word spoken by any of us. I mean, it was a kind of a surprise, frankly. Uh, under the circumstances, I thought we might have slipped, which has happened on other flights, but we did not one thing said in that regard. So at, at any rate, it uh, shows what I know about movies, though, because, you know, you really think about it, uh, a movie is uh, judged by uh, Academy Awards, I guess, if you're a critic, an artist, critic. And this thing was up for 10 Academy Awards that year, won several. And secondly, it's a business. They did to spend over $50 million, and they expect, obviously, to make some money. And it was a, it really was a blockbuster. Uh, I guess uh, 
counted overseas. Uh, the only one that beat it at the box office that year was uh, Batman. <laughs> so it was uh, not a good company. And certainly, if you said now, from that aspect, certainly it was very successful. And it's probably good they didn't take any of my thoughts, or it would have been a bomb. <laughs> Uh, but, but one thing that rang true, uh, I thought they did a good job on, on top of all of that, is the, uh, the thread or the sense of a group of people uh, that were the right people or had, they looked intelligent and prepared to have training, that were assembled as a team uh, with the right leadership and organization to face great challenges and literally pull off a minor miracle. Now the failing in the movie here, and I can't blame them, is the true size of the team. The, the movie, of course, uh, focused on uh, mission control and ourselves in flight, and at least the one sequence dealing with the cartridge fix had a little bit of offline people, but it really was a huge team. Now, if you took the whole Apollo program, uh, there were almost half a million people working on Apollo across this country. Uh, we had contractor uh, to go to subs and sub sub subcontractors and piece parts. Uh, we had contracts in every state except one of the Dakotas. I'm not sure it was North or South. So we had a very large group, which is another reason I have trouble with these people thinking it's a hoax. You'd have to have five, half a million people on the con to, uh, to pull it off. But at any rate, I don't think they realize the scale of the scope of the program. And it wasn't just mission control. They were kind of, I call it the front line and the orchestra leader. But when they had a problem, uh, the way I understand it was done, a person was called in that I guess Gene and uh, other people thought, well, this is the best person to go work this. And they were given kind of carte blanche. So they ended up calling or gathering other people on their ad hoc team from wherever, uh, from Kennedy, uh, the NASA contractors, uh, Marshall, uh, NASA contract, wherever, wherever the talent that they knew had to help them meet a pretty crisp timeline, in some cases, to go figure out how to do what had never been figured out to do before. And the timeline was no uh, relinquishing. Uh, we're going to be back for entry in four days, ready or not. So that was the, the cast. I don't, have no idea who got called or counseled or was involved in meetings, brainstorming. Uh, my guess is there were thousands of people uh, lost a lot of sleep during those four days to make what happened happen. And obviously uh, that budget uh, would have been a lot bigger to carry the cast. But the truth is, I asked Bill Paxton, I saw him later when he was uh, making Twister in Oklahoma met him up there and asked him about that. He said, well, you got to remember, if you want to develop an actual character, you can only, you only got time to develop so many. And, and incidentally, they even shorted that in Mission Control. And Gene France, quote, is the flight director. In truth, there were four flight directors during his flight. Uh, Gene France, uh, Glenn Lunny, Bill Gwendler, and uh, Jerry Griffin. Jerry Griffin was the fourth flight director. In fact, another kind of fallacy in the movie, incidentally, was Gene, once this, he was on shift when this explosion happened, once he went off shift, he really didn't spend a lot of time back in mission control. The other three flight directors then shifted to three shifts to kind of carry on business as usual, call it business as usual. And Gene worked mostly offline, worrying about these open items, where that, again, this large cast of people and talent base uh, figure out things. Same way in the movie, incidentally, Ken Mattingly was never in uh, The movie played that up with John Aaron and one other guy. And that, that was a larger cast because you had to have the talent base that covered every system in that vehicle to worry that power up. And they worried it offline and developed straw man procedures, but then the astronauts that tried out the procedures, they wanted them to be like us, not having any knowledge other procedures, didn't get the cold. And Ken was involved in the group and the brain trust that was inventing the procedure. So it wasn't fair for Ken to go run in the simulator. He knew too much. He wanted to be like, we were going to receive it and have to go play it without having to practice. 
So that was the way that was done. And frankly, also, many procedures were devised for the lunar module. Ken, I, as far as I know, had only been in the lunar module a couple of times in his life, and they had never trained. So the people that were involved in the limb side was a different talent mix, both in mission control as well as astronauts. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, again, I'll say uh, for Hollywood, I'll give them uh, their due, and I still, I think it was probably the best uh, to kind of give you a portrayal of what a real mission's like uh, in a film that Hollywood has uh, produced, and I've seen uh, most all of them. I'd like to now get the, the video going again and uh, talk you through some of the real stuff. Do it yourself. What's that? Do it yourself. I am. I am. <laughs> this button called play here. <laughs> and I think I got all the volume there. Yes, I did. At least I'm hoping I know what I'm doing. Here we go. Uh, this is a 13-minute uh, uh, documentary that we really devised ourselves with uh, the media yeah. operation at Johnson uh, for use post-flight. I've been through it many times. And it accidentally ended up 13 minutes, incidentally, not by, uh, not by plan. Uh, it's probably nothing new for a lot of you in the audience here. The Saturn V we flew is still a big, big machine. Uh, somebody gave us this later, 363 feet, I think. The way I tell people I can understand it better is that if it's laying on its side, like you see in that nice museum out of Kennedy, and overlaid it on a football field, it's the football field plus both end zones plus three feet. So that's the Saturn V. And I'm happy they, in one way I'm happy they preserved uh, a few to show. On the other hand, I wish I'd have used parts of several of them that are left around to fly Apollo 19. But yeah. uh, here we are, suited up, uh, a couple hours that process started uh, before we headed out. And jumped into this, I uh, guess, converted milk wagon. <laughs> had painted up a little fancy on the outside. There's some benches in there to sit in and they had a intercom hook up so you could talk to the uh, suit techs. Deke Slayton uh, rode out with us. At the launch pad, it's kind of a strange launch morning because uh, you're met by the closeout crew, which is four people up there and then two suit techs that go along with you. And I served that role. I was on the I was the astronaut and the closeout crew for both Apollo 8 and 11. And uh, then they, it's quiet. I mean, the launch pad normally has a lot of people working up there. And you go out on launch day and there's, that's all that is there. Uh, this is the uh, firing room of those days, Kurt Davis you saw, and the others that know people will recognize several of the NASA management team. And a sea of consoles uh, behind it, because uh, there were three boosters and two spacecraft. So you needed a lot more consoles than you'd be used today in the shuttle. There's actually, uh, I guess, five vehicles plus an IU was needed separately, an instrument in it that IBM had. Uh, the, the liftoff itself uh, had some vibration. You saw that in the, mo in the movie. Uh, I'm not sure they overdid that a little bit. It didn't seem that bad. And frankly, the vibration level and the G levels, uh, including max G, which was about four and a half Gs in staging, uh, were a lot less than I had experienced in fighter airplanes. When you're dogfighting, uh, you routinely pull five, six Gs, even with those previous era aircraft that pulled more than that today with an F-16 or 14 or 18. And I've had vibration levels higher, flying low levels at very high speed, uh, enough that you get jolted around enough. I've had lacerations on my shoulders, my shoulder straps after I climb out of the airplane. Uh, so the vibration level, and that you know, wasn't what, what a big deal compared to flying airplanes. And you're laying on your back, which is a better position to be in than sitting upright for taking the G level. The one thing that was traumatic, though, was that staging. Now, they overdid that with the people kind of falling forward in the instrument panel, and we were warned about that. Um, and of course, we were very tightly strapped down, so we didn't have that danger. And it was traumatic. When that thing quit uh, very abruptly, it, uh, and then things <coughs> clattered to, to separate separation rockets. And a short time before the next stage got its engines gone, it was sort of like a minor train wreck in that uh, period of time. The ride otherwise was smooth on the S2. 
when he lost the center stage, and I thank one gentleman here tonight who worked on the S4B, uh, thank him for helping us make up for the uh, energy we lost with that center stage engine going on the S2 to get in orbit and get our uh, second burn to leave Earth and head for the moon. And that's where we are here. We had a uh, couple of revolutions to check systems out, including backup systems you could check out before committing to TLI, the burn that uh, sets you out on the way to the moon. Uh, at one of the exit velocities and entry velocities were 36,000 feet a second, roughly, or 25,000 miles an hour. And uh, Jack Schweigert is flying and is turned around to go put the probe in that upper hatch of the limb. And Doc, uh, where the latches are set and they pulled tightly together, you have an airtight seal. So the tunnel, uh, you'll see a picture of that later when I'm flipping around down through the tunnel. That's the third stage, and I think this is the first flight, the S-4B through Vinny was remaneuvered to impact the moon. We had left seismometers on Apollo 11 and 12, so it gave a sort of a meteorite semblance of a, uh, to get data, subsurface data on the moon from those seismometers. That was a TV show we staged, uh, only the people in mission control you can see pretty relaxed and happy or uh, enjoying that show. The mission, had, other than that S2 problem, uh, it had gone very well. It was kind of routine. And right after that, uh, when we were, like I said, I was still putting stuff away, we had pulled out for the show and tell show, we had the uh, bank. I'll say a few words uh, at the end of this video about that. Uh, this now is a scene I was shooting. You can see my shadowy figure to the right using the battery-powered 16 millimeter camera we had of the dead powered down command module. The hatch there was strapped down in the couch to keep it out of the way. And I'm drifting down through the tunnel from the command module into that uh, small limb where pretty much after about a day when it really cooled all the way down, we all three nestled in the limb for some body warmth. And uh, again, playing around in zero gravity, a little camera cover, you can see I'm flailing around. And zero G uh, with small confines of anything, you know, really, are, it's, it's very handy and nice to have. Uh, I mean, a way to envision that is if we were all in zero G, we could, Charlie, you could have. Uh, made a lot more money for the museum because we had have another set of chairs and tables on the ceiling. You're wasting all that space up there. Uh, that's Ed Mitchell. Uh, you'll see Tom Staff. You see a lot of the gang here who were uh, sweating us out, uh, furrowed our brows, a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, simulators ran, uh, I was told, 24 hours a day. Every simulator we had. We had two of them at Johnson and three of them down here at Kennedy. So those were manned uh, 24 hours a day, checked not every minute, but time to time checking uh, procedures and they'd been redlined and they'd come back and get verified again before anything got passed up to us. There's a checklist, uh, one above there with the pages unfurled, and again, uh, I think I'm shooting my own self here. Uh, that's Bob Gilruth. Deke here, uh, Slate, Deke Slayton is holding the uh, canister mod they made on the ground. And uh, a lot of people here were instrumental in that. Uh, as far as testing, though, they took it into a chamber, I understand, in Building 7 in Houston, and tested it in a vacuum with a limb environmental system that was set up there to verify again it would work before it was uh, sent up to us. I was not involved in that. I think the film had me break into plastic or something. I was uh, off duty. It's the way we shifted for two days. I was on alone, and Jack and Jim were on, and we rotated that way. And uh, so I, I just woke up and came back into the limb uh, about that time, and they had already built it. And for all I know, there was no tear in the uh, plastic material. Again, I'm a self cameraman here. That battery powered camera I just had running. That's the Earth looking at it from a lunar distance. Uh, Jim there has the uh, little Sony battery powered uh, tape recorder. We had recorded and brought music. That was our entertainment at times. In the back of the 
landing craft or limb, there's Jack Schweiger perched back there. That was his ball station. Uh, he's sleeping. And incidentally, uh, myself here sleeping, uh, my arms tucked in so they don't float up and wake me up. Uh, an interesting thing about Jack, though, is Jack had never, ever been in a real lunar module on the ground or anywhere. So the first time Jack was ever in a lunar module was in flight, on this flight. There's the uh, ruptured one quarter of the spacecraft. That upper portion should look as shiny and smooth as the lower section of the service module of the command and service module. At this point, we had jettisoned it, and we're really quite surprised to see that amount of damage. The explosion hadn't seemed that bad. But stop and think about it. We were lucky in a way. We had the explosion in vacuum, and explosions, uh, a large part of damage, is partly due to the secondary effect of air pressure waves down here. If you set up a bomb, that would be a, a lot of the damage done. And of course, in vacuum, you don't have air, so you don't have air pressure waves. Another little challenge for about a day and a half, uh, Mission Patrol told us not to dump any urine anymore. So we had to scrounge around and figure out all kinds of weird combinations of things to store urine on board. <laughs> and it really was a miscommunication. They meant to say, don't dump urine for a while, because we're dead in track data. But we thought they meant forever. <laughs> uh, entry itself was quite normal and uh, miraculous in a way. We got a little rain shower at the upper end where all the water had collected over everything. That command module, by the time we got ready to power it up, if you can imagine how pristine we worried about that thing down here, it looked like a fireman had come in there and squirted a spray hose in there. I mean, there was water everywhere, all over the instrument panel, and that's one thing I worried about was electric shorts. And a thing that I would say saved us there is after the Apollo 1 fire, mods were made, and one of them was the, uh, all the connectors were potted with, I think, a material called Melkor. Uh, again, uh, worrying about another fire. It turns out uh, uh, Melkor, and that uh, potting process this was done on all the end of uh, wiring and connectors, was waterproof. And so we might have had an electric shark had we not had that done after the Apollo 1 fire. Uh, we landed uh, where we originally planned in uh, about the Samoan Islands in the uh, Pacific, retrieved uh, on this helicopter, which Ron Howard, again, realism, he got the same, same helicopter for the movie. He must have had it repainted, put the number 66 on it, that you would see in the movie, and recovered us on uh, board the Iwo Jima, which was decommissioned at Norfolk about two years ago. Uh, Jim Lovell got a little bit part in the movie, if you look at uh, those that didn't notice, the, the uh, captain of the ship on the Iwo Jima is Jim Lovell. That was, uh, I think he showed up on a movie set twice during the filming, and one time they used him in that role. He had a lion, as I understand, walk him aboard or something, and they cut it. Uh, that's the three of us uh, there in a conversation with uh, President Nixon, who was at that time in office. Stop. There we go. Now, going back, uh, just to I'll make a couple of comments to sell, sell questions that again, invariably, I'm asked is one was what was my thoughts at the time of the explosion and i'd have to say my thoughts at the time of the explosion and for probably uh sometime uh several minutes afterwards was one of great confusion uh the reason is obviously the incident of the explosion and, and, and the, the sound that reverberated through the hull and uh where i was down the limb and started floating upwards there was crinkling noise in the tunnel area where the two vehicles were contorting and twisting metal enough to cause kind of a sense of you would take a, a Coke can or a uh, drink can and crinkle it with your fingers, which settled out after a bit. And, uh, but when I got to the, to the couch position and looked, and on the right side of the command module, uh, there was the cryogenic system, uh, the fuel cells, 
uh, the electric power systems, communications, and part of the uh, environmental system controls. Uh, but also looking instantly at the caution and warning array, which showed in the movie, uh, we had obviously the master alarm on, which came on with any one light of this little array of lights, which were red and yellow, and quite a number of them, for failures and s that covered failures in systems, where the red ones uh, generally meant something was bad, real bad. <laughs> Uh, the orange-yellow ones of those caution warning lights certainly meant something was wrong or bad, but not quite so bad. And uh, we had the order of uh, seven or eight of these lights on. And they were, the real confusion was they were in different systems. They covered uh, AC power, DC power, fuel cells, uh, cryogenics, the oxygen, uh, RCS. Uh, some of the valves had closed there, so we had RCS uh, low pressure. And th that was confusing because we there was no failure we'd ever looked at in training or anybody ever considered that would manifest itself in all of these lights on. And even in training, we dealt with lots of failures in every simulation. But a general philosophy was that was followed, uh, I put it as uh, we people that devised these scenarios uh, behind it was uh, the assumption that God would never be so unkind as to give us more than one failure in one system at one time. <laughs> so the failures that occurred during the simulation, you'd have a lot of failures, but they would be staggered, uh, not all at the same time. And, uh, and I knew it wasn't control. instrumentation. And see, that's the thing that hooked uh, Mission Control for 18 minutes. They thought it was not a real problem. Because uh, all these, the same way, that all this light array had to be something failed in the seaweed, caution warning electronics assembly, uh, that caused all these false lights to be on, because there's no single failure that would manifest itself that way. Uh, now for me, the, uh, and incidentally, we failed to articulate uh, immediately our out the window situation, or would have been obvious long before Jim finally made the call when he saw stuff streaming away when the sunlight landed on it. Because you could look out the window right away and there was a sea of debris around us with a thermal blanket after the panel had blown off was, was shredded, uh, little popcorn kernels of frozen uh, biogenics or oxygen. Some you could see real close. You could discern that was that a little ways away. It was just sparklies. Just a sea of sparklies out there uh, around us. So, you know, right away we knew something had let go and, and caused all this garbage we had out the window, but we didn't tell them this to control it. Because they would have a lot quicker realized this was the real problem. Uh, the confusion uh, turned out to just answer the question. A lot of the lights turned out to be where they were false lights for a different reason. Uh, most of the plumbing valves in the RCS were uh, Parker Hannafin valves outfit in Orange County, California, built these valves. And to conserve electricity, the way the valves worked was you had a spring-loaded switch, and you'd move it to open momentarily, and it would give juice to the valve to move it to open. And then you'd let go of the switch and go to neutral, and a spring would hold the valve open. Conversely, if you want to close it, you'd momentarily move the switch to close. And when it closed, uh, the spring would then hold it, you let go, so you weren't consuming electricity except during the periods that moved about. The problem for us was that we had talkbacks right above the switch that were gray if you opened the valve and would go barber pole when you closed the valve. The failing there was all that little square thing that went gray at barber pole, it was connected to the switch, not to the valve. The telemetry point for the valves only went to the ground. So we were looking at all those valves and they were all open. In fact, many of them had closed due to the shock G of the explosion and overcome the spring constant and had slammed valves closed that we thought were still open. So later when Mission Control caught up with this, they had the TM points, telemetry, uh, they were headed to recycle valves, but of course then that cured several of these problems that appeared to be problems. The thing that hit me, though, in a very, very short time was in scanning uh, the meters after looking at this light array and saying, what the heck went wrong? 
uh, was it was clear looking at the oxygen quantity, temperature, and pressure. All three needles for one tank were in the bottom, bottom of the instrument. So it told me we had lost one oxygen tank. And at that point, uh, I just got a, uh, a deep, sick feeling in my stomach because I knew that constituted the board without even looking at mission rules. We lost the, uh, I know we couldn't go in the lunar orbit, much less land. So we had lost uh, the chance to uh, fly the mission we had planned. So that was the sensation there. I've often tried to figure out ways to describe that for anybody here. But those that here are parents, uh, the time before I had that same sick feeling for a different reason, I, in Lancaster, California, I was uh, taking a young son with me to pick up a babysitter. We were going out for the evening. And when I stopped at the, the, the house to pick up the, the young lady, I accidentally, when I got out of the car, I slammed the door on my son's hand. And it was that kind of a sick feeling I had uh, that time in flight uh, about our situation. Because you have to remember, we had a second oxygen tank so in that moment, I wasn't worried about getting back. Uh, we had lots of oxygen. We had to uh, obviously cut the mission, but with, with that other oxygen tank, we'd have kept everything powered up and just come home. So it took a little time for that to evolve into what it turned out, because it was slowly, which we don't really know how or why, uh, that gradually depleted that second tank. Um, the uh, only things I'll say in, uh, in closing is, and uh, I mentioned it this afternoon, and I hope it's true for all those here that uh, participated, uh, certainly, and because uh, there's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, I, uh, I know a, a statistic that's not a good statistic. At one point during the program, due to the hours, uh, those test ops went on like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I think Cape, uh, Cape Kennedy or Canaveral, rather, uh, in Cocoa Beach area at large, had a statistics, uh, statistic you wouldn't want to have, but it had the highest divorce rate in the country. And I think a lot of that was driven by the divorce load and the, uh, uh, the kind of hours we all kept uh, trying to get there from here. I know at Drummond in one year, 1967, when I spent almost that whole year, I was uh, I was TBY uh, just about 11 months out of 14 months at that day. Lived in a trailer. In fact, sometimes I'd be there a week and wouldn't even get out. Out of the trailer, we had up against the clean room with a tunnel to get in there. And uh, we operated in 67 up there, I know, had one day off. Uh, that day was Christmas Day. Otherwise, the plant, the test ops run ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all, every day of the year except Christmas. And that, that the, same, the same drill was going on uh, down here to try to make the time out. So there was a lot of pressure, a lot of sacrifice, but I hope, regardless of, uh, of what you uh, had at heard and the, and the sacrifice made, that you feel, as I do, uh, certainly, that I'm just uh, happy and uh, just feel lucky and privileged was lived when I did. I would not I would not go back and start over. Because right now I do not see anywhere in the near vista anyway anything like the following. Uh, it was the premier program of the 20th century in both the sense of engineering and exploration. Uh, that was, it was the program. And boy I just feel lucky I uh, accidentally became an astronaut like I told you I wouldn't have, you know wasn't the plan. It just happened, right place, right time and I uh, got to be a part of it. Thank you.